Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Robust American Love. It is an absolutely gorgeous September afternoon in New York City, and I'm so happy to have you join us, whether it is now or later. Uh, my name is Karen Carboner, and I am the president of the Walt Whitman Initiative. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization here in New York City, celebrating the city's literary legacy. We're all about keeping poetry alive and well on the streets of New York and beyond. Uh, and we do serve as an organizing center for a lot of cultural activism, especially in Brooklyn. Uh, poetry related events such as the Song of Myself Marathon. You see Stefan Killen's absolutely gorgeous poster or at least part of it behind me here. That event was last week and one of the people who are joining us today, Adina Karasik was there doing a really beautiful reading. I wanted to just put a shout out for the many people who participated on a day that wound up being sunny inside because we had such terrible weather outside. So thank you everyone for being so flexible and moving inside and uh, hosting a kind of beat, beat a feeling um, poetry reading down at our partners Fulton Stone Markets. It was really, really wonderful. But in any case, we are all about that kind of event. We have other events coming up, including this Sunday, we have, a Brooklyn Book Festival bookend schedule of events starting at 5 p.m. I'm actually hosting a literary tour of the Seaport, South Street Seaport, which will st start off from 91 South Street, our partner's Fulton Stall Market. And if you all here in New York have not yet wandered in there, that is a local farmers co-op. That is a New York City farmers co-op. Amazing place. We've interviewed the the masterminds behind that project, but the real thing is just actually going down there and sampling the Manhattan honey or purchasing the Staten Island lavender. Uh, we're very proud to be partnered with them. And they are also the hosts of our Tain Poetry Library. I know I've been talking about that quite a while, but we're very proud that while other libraries are closing or shrinking, we opened a free access poetry library here in New York City, thanks to Susan Tain, who is our benefactor. She started off the donations with an exquisite collection of Whitman volumes, and we've expanded that. We've got, I think, and we're, we're cataloging still 600, 700 volumes upstairs at 91 South Street. Absolutely beautiful view of the Brooklyn Bridge from up there. And guess what? You can buy delicious food downstairs, come upstairs, read poetry, just hang out with us for free. And you can especially do that on Sunday because we're going to host open hours. You will get to meet our new librarian, Jay Sherry, who's just amazing and a, and a very renowned New York City librarian, actually. And he's got an assistant librarian who's volunteering, Emerald San Giorgio, who is helping with that cataloging process. So I really, really hope you can come down um, either for the tour at 5 p.m. or then the office, the open hours of the library start at 6 and at 6.30, Stefan Killen, who is the artist who designed our poster behind me, he is going to have a reading of his new children's book, which is just as beautiful as the art that is up there. And uh, it's called Crossings. It's based on Crossing Brooklyn Ferry. And this is a, a full family event, right? Kids, parents, whoever, uh, just come upstairs, hang out, have some good food, meet the artist, go explore our poetry books, and uh, we look forward to meeting you there. So that's all September 24th. Also on the horizon is something very new for us. We are doing Open House New York this year. I've never done that event, and that is a weekend in October, October 20th to 22nd. And if you haven't participated in that in New York, you should, because they open up doors to places that normally you can't really go inside. And we just thought we would use it as an opportunity to, again, welcome everyone to the library. I think downstairs, the guys at Fulton Stone Market are going to have tours, perhaps of the kitchen. So please keep your eye out for Open House New York Weekend, a great weekend to come visit the city, October 20th to 22nd. And we are working on other episodes of Robust American Love, of course. Uh, we've got one planned for November with 
John Kevin Jones, one of my favorite people. He is an actor who works very closely with the Merchant's House Museum downtown. And that's another thing you should go see if you haven't seen it. It is the only fully preserved 19th century building in New York City. Now, I don't want to take up a lot of time about this, but you all know I've been, uh, all of us here at the Whitman Initiative have been working very hard to try to preserve Walt Whitman's house in Brooklyn, 99 Ryerson Street, where he actually finished Leaves of Grass. That house is not landmarked. It is not protected in any way. There's no sign on the door saying Walt Whitman lived there. So we are very interested and very motivated by trying to preserve the literary history of New York. And so is the Merchant's House Museum, right? It's a really special place. And Kevin performs there seasonally. So I have here one of my favorite, and I hope you can see this. Oh, see, it's Zoom, so maybe you can't. But my one of my favorite souvenirs of all time, when Kevin did a recitation of Whitman's Live Oak with Moss poems this summer, he handed out fans with the famous iconic frontispiece of Leaves of Grass on there. So we were all fanning ourselves with Walt. And uh, Kevin will be doing Charles Dickens in December, I think starting actually November. So we'll be talking to him about personifying 19th century figures, very famous ones, very different ones, right? Dickens is a different animal than Walt Whitman, um, but uh, he's he's very exciting. And I really look forward to to speaking with him and, and having you tune in. So, but for now we have an extraordinary lineup and we're so proud to host this. I have to uh, shout out to the people behind the scenes because this show would not happen without a lot of people just working to make sure everything gets installed online. There's stuff going on in the background. We were even a little late logging on now because Zoom can be very complicated. So number one, I need to thank Zelia Raphael, who is right behind us, and she has made all of this possible. Zelia, you are amazing. Zelia is in Iceland. Uh, she is my graduate student, my PhD student, uh, working on a Whitman dissertation that's going to blow your mind. So look out for that name. And again, Zelia, thank you just so much for being there. Uh, and now the people in the front, um, this, this is very, very exciting. And I feel like we already have so much going on for just the, the single hour that we have. If you were on our website, you see that we called the show Containing Multitudes, the visual literature of Warren Lehrer with Adina Karasik and Judith Sloan. So there's a great trifecta of artists that we have to talk to. And the, the, the description that we have, just to read that, author artist Warren Lehrer's solo and collaborative books and multimedia product pro projects form a panoramic and very human chronicle of the American experience from boardwalks, fast food joints, youth detention centers, and mental health wards to the prismatic personalities of immigrant Queens, New York, and a half century of imaginary books by his literary alter ego, Lou Mobley. And we're gonna talk with Warren and Adina is joining us to help celebrate their latest project. Project. We're gonna hear her voice, which I was privileged to hear last Sunday and the, the gorgeous, gorgeous new book that they have, um, which I always have trouble pronouncing, Ouvert Oeuvre, right? Openings, there we go, with my worst French accent. Mm -hmm. Warren, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank and you. Adina, you too. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me, Karen. Great We're going to have a little cameo with Judith Sloan, my wife, who's a big part of my journey as well. I wanted to welcome Judith also. Judith, thank you so much for being here. So just to give you a little bit of background, they're going to they're going to jump in and tell you a lot more. Um, Warren is based in New York and he is from Queens. We share that because I am also from Queens. And I feel like Warren, you've actually kind of like energized. I know you guys run a nonprofit also out of Queens. So lots of good art Queens energy there. Um, he's known internationally as a quote, pioneer of visual, visual literature 
and design authorship. It's a really interesting term that we're going to explore, this idea of visual literature, right? The word portrayed. <clears throat> His solo and collaborative books and multimedia projects explore the vagaries and luminescence of character, the relationships between social structures and the individual, and the pathos and absurdity of life. And there's a long list of honors. I could, you know, please check our website. Warren also has a brilliant uh, website of his own where you can read more and some of the reviews that he's gotten. Ladislav Sutnar Lifetime Achievement Prize. I think that's from the Czech Republic, right, Warren? Is. Uh, just an amazing prize to get. The Center for Book Hearts here in the city honored him recently. Rockefeller Ford, you've got it. It's just very, very prestigious. And I guess you're not teaching anymore, right? But you were teaching for a long time, or are you I still teach, teaching? I've liberated myself from full-time teaching, but I still teach at the Designer as Author Entrepreneur MFA program, which I helped found 25 years ago as a, one of the founding faculty members at the Brilliant. School of Visual Arts. At, uh, sorry, I back up. At the School of Visual Arts, and I teach okay, at, my at class SBA in the spring, in the which is called Writing and Designing the Visual Book. Fantastic. Um, thank you for that. So you can still catch Warren if you're a student. He's still out there, still working at SVA. So check out the, the course catalog. Uh, a bit about Adina, who has a PhD. So Dr. Karasik, welcome again. Uh, she's a New York-based poet, performer, cultural art, cultural theorist, sorry, media artist, and author of 14 books of poetry and poetic. Her Kabbalistically inflected urban Jewish feminist mashups have been described as, quote, electricity in language. Another quote, proto-ecstatic jet propulsive word torsion. Wow, that's good. George Quasha, I have to remember that. Noted for their, quote, cross-fertilization of punning and knowing theater and theory. And again, Adina also has a list of honors, too numerous for us to mention right here. Uh, really impressive. And I was really struck by this, Adina, that you have an archive at Simon Fraser. So good, the Canadian students can go up there, I guess, and track your career doing these fantastic cross-disciplinary performances and, and readings. So again, thank you for being here. And Judith, lovely to have you here. Uh, this is, a, again, another privilege. Judith is an actor, educator, radio, audio artist, librettist, and human rights activist. All of that rolled up into one great bundle. Um, her work combines humor, pathos, and a love of the absurd. In addition to her plays, commentaries, documentaries, and collaborative works, as co-founder of this uh, IRSA, which is the nonprofit that Warren and Judith run together, she's the director of a two-decade-long program in arts education for immigrant teenagers. Amazing. Uh, she is also a faculty member at NYU's Gallatin School of Individualized Study. Good to know. We're colleagues and has been awarded multiple commissions and grants from New York State Council on the Arts, New York Foundation. And here's another list of wonderful awards. So Judith, again, welcome to the, to the program. And I guess, you know, we've got so much uh, electric artistic energy here. Maybe one place to focus on first, Warren, is going back to you. And uh, you've had such a varied uh, and a very long career just doing very exciting out of the bar box ideas of art, really transforming people's idea of reading, I guess, and looking. And uh, for those that are familiar with your work, I guess I'd like to ask, where, did, where does all this start? Like how... Were, was there any sort of early inspiration that took you down the Oops. first road that led you? You were breaking up, but I think I got your question. Uh, well, I was a visual arts major in college, and I was always writing on the side. 
poetry and short stories and for the school newspaper. And at a certain point, letters and words started to migrate into my picture making. And that fusion of writing and image making, uh, eventually typography, set me on a path that I'm still on today, writing and designing my own books that often sit at the center of multi-branched projects that include exhibitions and performance and animation and collaboration is a big part of my, my work as well. So unlike a lot of writers, you've always thought about the book as a, a, a visual, a visual components, right? Like something that is not just read and absorbed, but something that you can actually, I guess, touch and enjoy, right? A, a material object. Um, it reminds me of Whitman, right? Like I think you and Whitman have a lot in common that way because Whitman, of course, designed his own books, especially the early ones, really thinking very carefully about how typography affects your own interpretation of his character and of the poetry itself. And he started uh, out as a printer in his teens, right? And I was introduced to writing through the letterpress shop of my junior high school. And they, they have this term, the composing stick, when you're using, you know, letterpress as in Gutenberg, metal type, and you're setting it one letter at a time in a composing stick. And at a certain point, I started composing my own texts directly uh, with that composing stick. And oh, there are other affinities to Whitman as well. I mean, I, I love his rapturous embrace of, of language, but of the world and of America and of, of the, the spirit and of uh, through observation. And uh, he's one of these writers that I always and continue to go back to at the particularly at the beginning of a project for inspiration. Yeah, I saw a review of Crossing the Boulevard, um, which is just a spectacular work about immigrants, and somebody described that book as Whitman esque. Yeah, the Brendan Gill, uh, when we won the Brendan Gill Prize from the uh, archivists. Uh, the what was that, Judith? The um... it was the uh, the Brendan Gill Prize was yeah. from Municipal Art Society. Municipal Art Society. Yeah, they they described it as a Whit Whitman esque. We really appreciated that. Whenever yeah. I get a review that says Whitman esque, I I. <laughs> You don't have to just say that because of our because of us right here, but I think anyone who's seen your work or I should say experienced it kind of gets that feeling that if Whitman could have done the same thing, he would have he would have tried, right? Uh, there's that legend about him connecting with Thomas Edison at the end of his life and making the recording of himself reciting America, right? Like anything to bounce off the page. And I feel like you've managed a career in which you are constantly kind of asking the reader for more in such original and challenging ways. So I know you were gonna take us through a video that you created. Do you want uh, to? It, not a video, but a keynote. That, which is the Apple the slides, of right. Phone. So if I, and I'll just walk you through a little bit of my journey, if I can share my screen. Is this an okay time to do that? Yes, please uh, do. Share screen. Uh, you can see that. I'm going to hit play. And can you all see that drawing? I think we all can, yeah. Great. So this is one of a series of drawings I made in college, mid-1970s, that combined abstract marks, letter forms, and made up words. When I showed these drawings to a painting professor of mine at Queens College, he shook his head, wagged his finger in my face, and said, Warren, you're barking up the wrong tree here. Never combine words and images. They exist in two different spheres of the brain. They're two different languages. 
I left his office feeling like I'd been given a mission in life, and I've been combining words and images or making images of words ever since. Several years later, I went to grad school at Yale for graphic design to learn how to make my own books and multimedia projects. My graduate thesis was a score for eight two-person conversations inspired by people I'd met on Venice Beach. This book began a lifelong obsession and way of writing for voice on the page and the stage through typography, inspired by prismatic characters and the poetics of everyday discourse. I set each character in a different type family and the choreography of each dialogue on the page reflects the kind of interaction between the characters. Here you have a religious missionary talking around an unsuspecting subject. I don't use punctuation, but break lines significantly as in verse indicating pauses of breath or thought. And I only list the name of each character once at the top of the page. Printed on translucent paper, you see and hear approaching and receding conversations. Here's a married couple arguing in French, occasionally coming together in laughter. They continue arguing while these other two people flirt with each other on the same wavelength. I orchestrated multiple conversations at the same time, which built up till you had all eight pairs talking at once. I was very interested in seeing what that looks like on the page. I mean, you know, continues this approach of book as performance score, but with emphasis on interior thought through seven characters who inhabit the same building over the course of one day. I mean, you know, explores those synaptic gaps and utterances between thoughts and speech that bridge our sometimes imperfect search for meaning, I mean, and a desire to connect with others, you know. In 1984, my friend, the poet and journalist Dennis Bernstein and I wrote the play, wrote a play that was also a book that takes place at an American fast food joint. You enter the book, well, it depends if you come through the drive-through or on foot, and you meet all seven characters who either frequent or work at the restaurant. Each character is not only set in their own typeface, but also color. The text is illuminated with icons and images that evoke the fast food tableau and the internal projections of the characters. Carmen, the cashier, sings, next, please. Esther Rothschild walks up to the counter with her walker and says, just a cup of tea, please. I figure hot water in a Lipton tea bag. What can they do to it? That'll be all for here to go. For here, thank you. Oh, can I have an extra, an extra? She gets cut off. Next, please, with fries large, that all. For here to go and to drink a lemon thicky. Like Whitman, who embraces American vernacular, this work reflects both the visual vernacular of fast food franchises and the way people talk. Before the play book begins, one of the customers is found dead in a pool of blood and ketchup. Each character bears testimony to a different perspective on how and why she died. In act six, one hell of a political argument breaks out. This was the height of the Cold War when much like today, arguments could get very heated. Throughout the play, the character Louise is researching a book she's writing called The Potato in America, in which, among other things, she foretells spuds that are genetically engineered to repel unwanted pests. The glossary in the back helps define terms for future generations, such as for here to go or kitty coupons. I'm leapfrogging about a decade to the 1990s when I had an idea for a series of books based on American eccentrics. And each book would be proportional to a standing figure with a photograph of the person on the front and back covers and inside the guts, first person monologues, vignettes and stories. The first four books in the series formed a quartet of men. I had so many rich stories, I actually started using a column of text in Claude's book, I use slashes to indicate pauses. Unforgettable moments and epiphanies pierce the walls of text. Sit down comedian and stoop philosopher Nikki D from LIC's book is illuminated with a lifetime of memorabilia that animates his apartment. Go ahead and print it up. I've got nothing to hide. I told you I'm an open book. My whole life is an open book. 
What do you want to do? Make a bestseller and make everybody commit suicide? The people on the earth today don't give a damn about the things I got to say, which is what he told me, but then proceeded to pour out his life story growing up in the same apartment he still lives in, loading Liberty ships during World War II, the Great Stomach Explosion of 1964, and a lot of existential questioning. Charlie Lang, a dear friend and brilliant musician, has also struggled with bipolar disorder, misdiagnosed at 14 years old. On the left, describing being in the eye of an emotional tornado. On the right, getting stuck in a bad cycle in and out of psychiatric centers and halfway houses. Good news, Charlie is doing very well, living independently and making lots of music. Brother Blue was known on the streets of Boston as the John Coltrane of storytelling. My book focuses on the stories behind the stories he told about growing up during the Depression, civic, serving in World War II in the segregated U.S. Army, navigating his way in the white-dominated spheres of the ministry and academia, and becoming a roaming town crier. After I met, fell in love with, and married, the actor and oral historian Judith Sloan, the first book in the women's portrait series morphed into a solo performance and radio doc inspired by Andrea Gibbs, a white deputy sheriff in Mississippi, who along with three black deputy sheriffs blew the whistle on brutalities and murders perpetrated by guards in county jails, which led to a Justice Department investigation and federally mandated reforms to Mississippi prisons. The next documentary project Judith and I worked on together is about new immigrants and refugees who we met in our home borough of Queens. Crossing the boulevard, strangers, neighbors, aliens in a new America is the result of interviewing and getting to know hundreds of people from all over the world, a year and a half before 9-11, 2001, and a year and a half after. Our focus was on people who arrived post-1965 Immigration Act which forever changed the demographics of this country. We divided the book into five movements, beginning with people who came to the US seeking religious freedom. You meet each person via their photographic portrait, surrounded by their story told in their own words and objects and images they've carried with them from home to home. We feature stories of political refugees and asylum seekers, like a group of Loshampas, an ethnically cleansed Hindu minority from Bhutan, a woman originally from Afghanistan whose own photography chronicles her journey. Many refugees we met fled countries where political persecution and war were supported in part by US foreign policy. And ironically, they sought refuge here in the United States. Bovik and Tosi fled the U.S.-backed military and dictatorship in the Democratic Republic of Congo, arrived at JFK Airport, and was arrested and detained at a windowless detention center adjacent to the airport. After two years in detention, he was released with the help of the Lawyers Committee for Human Rights. And a little bit of his story. I'm going to thank God every day that I did meet so many friends inside that nightmare detention center from all over the world. I'm going to laugh now every time I feel like crying because there's nothing left I have to lose. I'm going to sing now even though I cannot sing very good because there is no more rule on me that I cannot sing. A guard can't take me to the clinic like I'm a crazy person and say there's something wrong with me singing in the dormitory. If I meet someone new to this country, I'm going to give them hospitality that I did not receive. And by the grace of God, I will get a job and make clean the water here too. I'm going to discover America outside those cinderblock walls. I'm going to enjoy the life because I have the human right now to enjoy. I have the right now. Now, looking at the time, uh, I'm going to go past some more of the crossing the boulevard i was going to play an animation uh which was part of the exhibit that went with this show oh and, i uh, think you should play the animation warren play the animation okay <laughs> <laughs> don't don't let them miss that so so this is from the last section of the book which is unlikely bedfellows where 
uh, people from all over the world who live in Queens uh, have something in common, like politics or being at an international high school or playing ping pong or music. And uh, so this is a little bit of uh, Eugene Hoots from uh, Google, Google Bordello talking to Judith and I about his theory of globalism. Is a ridiculous marketing heads concept that helps them to sell things that people don't necessarily understand. You know, and it's basically actually killing the culture. Globalization. Globalization. Because it waters everything down. Oh yeah, this is a hip hop beat with Arabic voice over it. Oh yeah, this is global stuff. It's all great. You know, you can sell it anywhere. It has no edge, it has no soul. It's like, it is, it's like a mall music. Where you can buy all these stupid souvenirs and shirts that you can't tell where they're from either. People are being completely confused. You know, and that's what global culture is going to bring, is this Brazilian or Arabic, eventually. And there will be um, 300 million states of America around the world. It's just kind of this, this feeling of sameness, you know? Like when you drive through America, you're like, okay, well, this is Massachusetts and this is Connecticut. What's the difference? I don't fucking know. Gas station McDonald, McDonald gas station, gas station McDonald. Pretty soon you'll go to Slovenia and see the same shit too. In a mall. So I'll stop the video there, but you can watch the full video on YouTube or listen to Eugene's theory of multi contra culture where you reject your tradition, inhale a lot of new stuff, and create an entity of, it, of its own. He says, by mutating the tradition, you keep it alive, which I think is pretty similar to what Walt Whitman was saying in his essay, Slang in America. Uh, and I'm gonna skip over the 1001 Voices Symphony for a New America, libretto by Judith, music by Frank London and expressionistic supertitles designed by me. But I will show a window installation we did for CUNY Law School in Long Island City after Donald Trump issued his first Muslim ban. The text is the concluding anthem Judith wrote for a thousand and one voices symphony, reimagining Emma Lazarus's new Colossus poem that's on the pedestal of the Statue of the Liberty. Judith will read the anthem as I walk through the panels. Wait, go back here, oh, everybody. Here we go. Here, everybody comes inside to my table, even if they were at war. Oops, yes. With each other somewhere else. Here, everybody starts again in a new tongue, hanging on, letting go. What's lost is gone. Close the door, a window flies open. Give me your children orphaned by war. They're free and they're brave and they're tired and poor. Sons and the fathers together alone, making a life where the future's unknown. Mothers foreclosed on, tossed out the door, yearning to breathe where we're taught to want more. Here, everybody has a shout deep inside them, crossing borders, crossing paths, aching for, eager to. Give me your nightmares harbored inside. The kings and the queen stole the truth in the night. The nights are all restless where dreams can be born. Give me your losers and lovers refused and forlorn. A thousand one voices sing out to survive. Tell me your stories. I'll keep them alive. Thank you, Judith. 
For five years, we, Judith and I, also collaborated with the White Plains Business Improvement District and my community design class at SUNY Purchase, transforming vacant storefronts with visual poetry about the people and conditions in that city, produced as large-scale installations. In those five years, we transformed hundreds of storefronts and eventually some construction barrier walls, helping revitalize the downtown and lowering the vacancy rate. I've come to really enjoy that balance between working on poetry projects in various media and writing and designing long form prose projects. My illuminated novel, A Life in Books, The Rise and Fall of Blue Mobley, published in 2013, contains 101 books within it, all written by my fictional author protagonist who finds himself in prison looking back on his life and career. Blue's memoir is paired with a retrospective of all his books, including their cover designs, catalog copy, and excerpts that read like short stories. Like Whitman, my protagonist learns to be a printer at an early age. In Blue's case, in the letterpress shop of his junior high school in Queens, where he prints the school newspaper and composes his first books about his mother and father he never knew and the father he never knew. I can't get into much of Blue's life's life and book story, but I will tell you, he becomes a reporter. Then for about a decade, he writes experimental novels like The Switch, about a day on earth when everyone is switched with their number one enemy. Narcissistic Planet Disorder, about a planet that thought it was the center of the universe. The Book of Lies, inspired by his best friend, who turned out to be a pathological liar a one sentence 365 page novel that takes place inside the mind of a man painting a red barn red, a novel set in a land where the corporation supersedes all other jurisdictions. He wrote short story collections like All My Men Were Musicians and I'm Tone Deaf. When Blue's daughter is stricken with a potentially deadly blood disease, which requires medical care his health insurance won't cover, he works on replacing the esoteric writing categories in his mind with more commercially viable ones that correlate to categories that actually exist in bookstores. His first murder mystery, A Damn Good Plot, is followed by One Good Plot Deserves Another, followed by Plotsville. He forays into pet lit, culinary murder mysteries, and a pop-up book on the history of capital punishment. Toward the end of the novel, Blue fears that books are not nearly as central to people's lives as they once were. So he starts making book toys for boys, a line of book lamps that light up a table and give off a warm literary feeling, book clothes and accessories, a line of two-ply toilet paper poems, and finally, the flying book project, consisting of large scale leaves of poetry that fly over town and country, first launched with excerpts from Whitman's The Leaves of Grass. And uh, I mounted, after the book came out, a uh, traveling retrospective exhibit. And I've just finished fleshing out one of the 101 books into its own. Uh, full-length novel, which hopefully will come out in 2024. Uh, let me look at our timing here. Okay, so uh, the well, if I last... could if I could jump in, Warren, yeah. just because uh, you know it's it's a uh, absolute embarrassment of riches. There's so much to talk about here, and I know we don't have time to get to everything. But I wanted to thank you first of all for visually portraying your career <laughs> for us. It's actually so much more pleasing than reading a wiki entry or even looking at your website, you know, to just like get your narrative too, like hear it through your, uh, you know, through your words. And thank you for making it look interesting. I mean, that's the other thing about it, that, that it's really dancing even off of my screen. And I guess I walk away like impressed with so many things, but um, the the public service component seems so prescient, like the the idea of actually taking this art and doing some good with it. So just to just because that passed by so quickly, I wanted to get that one more time. You all decorated storefronts that were empty, right? With design in an effort to to just, I guess, spread messages of various kinds and also to just enliven the different cities that you were that you were working in is that right yeah well so i te 
or taught this class community design, which did uh, sort of graphic design pro bono for the nonprofit sector and aspects of the campus. And uh, the White Plains Bid Business Improvement District folks came to me and said, we have a real problem with vacancy of, of business mm -hmm. in the downtown. Can you and your students like make images, pictures for the for the windows, and I, I kind of reshaped the um, that um, brief that they handed me to have more content. We brought Judith in to write poems after interviewing people and looking at oral history archives in White Plains, and then working with the students. They then visualized those poems, and that went on for five years. And they really credit that project with helping uh, create more interest in the in the downtown and and revitalizing it. Hopefully, without uh, gentrifying. Uh, <laughs> uh, what, what a spectacular quickly, thing! Yeah, go ahead. Um, just uh, that we wanted it to be more than decoration, so that the interviews and the stories and looking that people would walk by and see their story or a neighbor's story or some evoke something, even though it was poetry, that it would make them stop and read it. Mm. So mm -hmm. I need to ask you all because you are married, right? Yes. So, and you know, you've been together a long time and you work together. True. Oh my which, God. which is pretty amazing, you know, that everything is is just still going so smoothly. How does that work with the two of you? How do you syncopate? Like, who does what? Well, we do work on our own work as well. Right. So that there's a balance. So I'm working on a solo show with other people and Warren's working on his own work. And then when we come together, we have come, we were introduced as two people that were focused on oral history, moving it into art. He more in the visual world and me more in the sonic uh, mm. theater world. And so we brought, we married our skills. <laughs> and for the sake of our marriage, we make sure not to collaborate on every project. Um, but, but, you know, there's a kind of seamlessness between our life and our work that's, that's very natural. And so it, it works for us. I think it and comes out in the energy, uh, the vivaciousness of the art itself. And then I think that since I know what Warren does so well, I'm working on a new project where the composer and I are saying, oh, well, let's save that. Warren can do something with that. We're having those conversations now, even though we haven't approached him about it yet. Can you tell us more about that project, too? Uh, it's on climate change. I interviewed many, many people of all different ages about to you know what what they think about climate what comes to mind but also people who are experts and activists and you know really a range of ages from 16 to 80 and mm. so as we're doing it and we're researching it we're thinking oh we don't want this to just be a video of fires and you know metal being extracted out of the oil but warren could come up with something else mm. And where where can people see that show? When is that popping up? I'm going to do an excerpt October 28th, and I'll I'll put a link in the video chat. Yeah, please so do. I don't take up any more time. Okay. Okay. Great. Looking at the our hour and what's left of it, I think it would be a great time to bring Adina Karasik. I think it is time, here. Adina, come out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey. <laughs> So you all, well, frame it for us because we can run over a little bit and I don't want to rush. I mean, it's it's really a shame to to miss the opportunity. So let's say we'll go to like 240. Is that OK? Like that that way we can relax a little bit and have uh, a little bit more of a conversation. Yeah. Um, tell us more about the book project, Warren. Maybe you can start. Well, uh, Adina and I were introduced originally by Frank London, who's a composer and musician who has worked with both of us, wrote the music for the Thousand One Voices and created a, do you call it an, uh, an opera, poetic opera, Adina? Uh, and they've worked on various projects together. And so we were introduced and we got to know each other's work. And I started 
teaching Adina's poetry in one of my classes, and I found out she was teaching uh, some of my work in her. Wow, article. amazing. Yeah. And then what, Adina? Well, and then, well, yeah, so I was so, you know, I was smitten with what he did. And of course, you know, I'm teaching the artist book at Pratt. And of course, it's just made so much sense. And then he came to Pratt and we just, you know, we, because there was such a melding of ideas and possibilities, um, I thought it would be really fun to work together. And so I was, um, it was during COVID and I was, you know, it was at a moment where things were opening and closing and I was in Hawaii of all places, right. basically stuck there. And I was writing oh, this. Who are you? Yeah, exactly. I was in Hawaii. <laughs> it was terrible. And, um, but so I started writing this poem at the beginning about openings, about how things were opening and closing and just the wretchedness and the horror of, you know, you just didn't know from one moment to the next, what was going to happen. And I was in dialogue with Warren at the time. And I said, you know, I think I just, I, I think this is, you know, a place that we can really you know, it would be a perfect collaboration. And he kind of fell in love with the poem. It was in its early stages. Of course, it went on to not only be that one piece, but a follow up piece about once things were open, um, how do we negotiate that sense of touching that sense of intimacy when, you know, the world is just shifted so dramatically. And so it is. And the book was born. Wow. Oh my goodness. So can we, can we hear some of it? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. What, what would, uh, the first poem. Well, is, yes. I was just going to just, just time wise. The poem consists of these two poems and um, one on openings and one on touching. Each one is roughly five minutes. So um, do we have time to read the whole, we'll just, we'll read only one, of course. Okay. But well, we let's try one and let's see where it takes us, because, I mean, part oh, of I the think. joy of this is reacting to it. Too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. You want to leave some of that time, but but I'm excited to hear at least one. So I'm going to uh, share the screen. Hold on a second. Uh, you can all see that. Yes. And keep the pace. Huh? The Adina. Yeah. Okay, Adina, here we go. All right. Oops, no, no, one second. Uh, okay. Ouvert. Ouvre. Openings. And in the opening of the opening, and in the opening of the opening, the unnerving specter of a specter of a return, of all that can never be returned. I'm going to have to read it from the book if you're going to do that. What? I, I, I don't know if there could be a lag. I think there's a lag. Oh, I know. It okay. looks so pretty. <laughs> okay. That's just good. And in the opening of the opening, the unnerving specter of a specter of a return of all that can never be returned. The opening represents a kind of iterability grounded in infelicities. Corruptions, eruptions, delays, a circumambulating, a destinerance amid the feasts of mourning. I always dream of a open that would be a syringe, a Jacques Derrida. And the opening is a premise, a promise, opening, opening. Uh, I'm reading it. Yeah. Sorry. When the opening is a premise, a promise, opening, 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 opining, pierce, pulsing, policies, policing, open, upana, up and up and an up and a panage and up 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 and up
as opening is so often often on pending penning opium to disclose reveal become manifest exposed as a 2303 23 663 million worldwide have been exposed Let the walls open the bridges borders bastions and bodies open scores 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 of terrifying silences open the thousand darknesses of murderous speech opening opening the streets are opening gates eyelids shadows measures cities machines foundations chains roads and relations ideological sedimentation the field is opening the night is opening opening the pen the pun the pons the pan the pan opening the letter is opening Sick really? fictions, dictions, dichotomies, definitions, contractions, extractions, opening indices, hypotheses. The letter is opening, opening to what constant reader who's open wardrobe of what could open up, which open see who's open mic just open my head and the high windows open this day, this door, this open house of whispered scream scrawl struggle open the space of emergence, my mouth your legs opening up and toward the open air hours arrows on we audible in the mouth aching ox soak sea spray semantics open the lights and lick rim slit wet were opening through rock please see span spread this sense opening in the gloaming, opening all that's forbidden, unbidden, unbinding doubts and evasions, laws and restrictions, encryptions, evictions, vacancies, vacants, parlance, entrants, vernissage, assuage, agendas, engendered engagement, enragement, overtures. Apertures, an intro, an entry, soft opening portals, border passage, opening between lips, grips, gasps, grasps, gasps, the grasps, axe, gaps, the fleshy lexical, exilical elixir. Of slip, slips, lapsed, wrapped, the wet caress of mounting sweat, opening. Openings, a happening, a hopening, ipening, happening, a ripening, enacting borders, borders, lungs, tongues, Fisters, follies, valleys, volleys, offending, pending, suspending, expanding, pandering, meandering, the openings, an event, a rupture, and a redoubling excess, and a nexus of vexes, anguishes, fragilities, agilities, a gift, a riff, ever arriving. And in Ala Moana, La Perla is opening. Zara is opening. But you can't try on clothes. The ocean is open. But you can't lay in the sand. Long Janus is open. But you can't go inside. Bathrooms are open. But surfaces are plagued. Sephora's in euphoria. Euphoria of memoria. 
Costco's open, but samples are closed. Skies are open, but Cuba is closed. Parking is open, but valets are closed. Peace talks are open, but systems are closed. Open is open, but Ipanema is closed. Airplanes are open, but runways are closed. My mouth is open, but the book is closed. So maybe we should leave it at that. Oh my God, that's amazing. That's uh -huh. amazing. There you go. One thing I, I should mention at the <laughs> back of the book, um, which is quite cool. I know Warren was going to mention this, but just in case we forgot. So this book, um it's got a qr code which we've never seen in a book before and frank london com uh composed and played the music and so if you click on the qr code you can hear as well the whole reading with the music so you can read it with the music without the music or you can hear and and have that as one of the voices um moving through and that just seems so important because I, I mean, I can't, I, it's a book, right? But, but I feel like I've experienced it in a very different way. Uh, although now you're saying, you know, if somebody opens the book, they can actually experience it also just use the QR code. Yeah. Uh, it's so performative. I mean, it's absolutely gorgeous on the page, but then the animation of the voice just like adds this overlayer that it's, I felt like, you know, I, I was just in a trance, just beautifully done. Yeah. Um, was it conceptualized, Warren, as an oral piece when you wrote it? Well, uh, that uh, Adina wrote it. Oh, and, right. Okay. And Let, and let's get this sent... straight. So Adina wrote, I wrote it. And then he visualized that he took, you know, I wrote it just in regular lines or the way that I would normally right and then I sent it to him and then he took like sometimes he would just put a few words on each page or you know and he would well you should speak about the graphematics of it all well it is a very sonic poem so I wanted to bring that out it's very propulsive poem so words would get will as you see get larger and larger and smaller and smaller it's also alliterative poem and so where we're hearing sounds that are rhyming or resembling each other, I'm bringing that out sometimes by accentuating the O's and then the O's multiply like COVID cells. And I use, uh, you know, parentheses and brackets as metaphors for these kinds of borders of inside and outside and those kinds of considerations are part of part of my process and and then we knew we wanted it to also make this connection enhanced by the recorded soundtrack and then for people to come see us live, live. we do events like on uh october 6th at center for book arts is our official book launch at 7 p.m and we would love people to come come to that this That's is a good amazing. opportunity to to plug uh, because I, I think we're all on fire about this. And Adina, just really thinking about your composing process and I guess you, as a performer, kind of composing a bit differently and then Warren setting it up to be sort of like visual poetry, which is really spectacular. So when people go to CBA, to the Center for Book Arts on October 7th, what are they going to, are you going to have a screen? Or how how does it work? It's uh so it's Thursday night, October sixth at seven o'clock. It'll be uh it'll be on the screen, and I'll be performing in front of it, so you'll be here and see both things happening. We'll be uh performing both poems certainly. And, and then Karina Reynolds, the director of the Center for Book Arts, will have a conversation with us, and uh, then we'll sign books and party and. Uh, it's just a correction. It's Friday, October 6th. Oh, Friday. Thank you, Judith. We've changed the date several times, so we're going to reiterate it here. Friday, October 6th, right? At and 7 p.m. at the Center for Book Arts Steve on the seating is Chelsea limited. If you go to their here. website to we register. put the link in. It's I free. put the link in the chat. Thank you. Um, I know we are, I, I mean, I feel like it's such a shame to end the show, but maybe we can end it on a high note 
by just thinking about the, the multiple types of talent that are in this space, do you have any recommendations or tips for young artists out there who are seeking to break new ground as you have? Like, what are the, what avenues can they explore to maybe be able to, to free up their, their art as you well, have? I would say follow your instincts, especially if they're not destructive ones. Uh, at a certain point, reflect on what you're doing, who you're doing it for. Let that let it contain multitudes. Let yourself contradict yourself, <laughs> and extend, and and revel in in those uh, paradoxes and strange juxtapositions, and allow yourself just to say yes. I think that's easiest. It's it's facilitated when you know you have a community, right? Did you all have people? to support you and to maybe, I don't know, get inspiration from? And is there anyone still out there? Is there, is there a place where young people can go to find this kind of support? Well, you know, depending on what they're doing, there, there are places. And I think the important thing is to go for with and for people who are interested in what you're doing and care about you. And for those squashers, those people who who uh, are, or it feels like they're squashing what you're doing, maybe you can somehow figure out how to uh, use that negativity as, as fuel. And also, I would just say that to anybody doing anything, performance or writing, go to things, see where you feel like you belong, I've been sending a lot of my, I'm bringing my NYU students to the New York and Poets Cafe because they're closing for three years for a renovation and then they'll reopen. But, you know, go to open mics, go to things, see who's mm -hmm. in the community, find people, and you'll be surprised how many people you become friends with. The musician that I'm working with now and collaborating with, I met him through, uh, like, somebody else you know I mean I met him in 2015 through another person who I met through another person and who oh he would be a good director for your show oh he would be a good right. musician and I think that's part of what happens so you gotta move out there and see where you fit and hang back sometimes and say oh this is not for me or oh this is for me that's so true, Judith. What what brilliant advice to to actually go out there and support others is a way of supporting yourself to find that community. And you're right. My my own experience has been that way too. Like the more people and the more you support others, it's all good energy out there to just uh, find these performances. October sixth at the Center for Book Arts. Judith, one more time. October 28th at the People's Voice Cafe, and I'm actually inviting three colleagues who also do work on various projects like prison education and migration and, you know, short poems. So it's it's a way of building community with that as well. And I put the link in the chat for whoever, so... <laughs> Thank you. I think people know where to go. We're very proud to support you too. We believe in what you all three of you are doing and, and so happy that I had a little bit of a chance. I have so many questions, but I can't get to them. Hopefully what was delivered here, all of this beauty and energy is going to inspire a lot of really interesting energy in response. So thank you. Thank you, Adina. Thank you, Judith. And thank you very much, Warren, for thank just you, stopping man. by. And I look forward to seeing you guys in October, October and 6th. Thank you for okay. being so <laughs> generous and committed. And thank you, you Zila, Zilia, you behind the together. scenes. Right. right. Gotta stick together. Thank you all so much. All right. Take care, everyone. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Take care. Bye.